Okay, we get started. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dan Hanlocker here. Uh, I've known him with Tony Compute for about 15 years. Uh, we're together at, uh, at Xerox uh, for a while, uh, where he had the luxury of being, uh, having a joint appointment in Cornell and Xerox. Uh, he was at Park for a number of years. Uh, after, uh, I think in the early 2000s, he actually left and went to the dark side to uh, become a businessman and, uh, and uh, help start a company called Indigen Market. And then since then he's come back to Cornell where he uh, has a joint appointment as a professor in business as well as a professor in computer science. Hopefully we got right. Yep. And uh, lately he was, uh, you know, co with his co-worker, uh, Mark Campbell here. Uh, he was uh, leading the um, Team Cornell at the Dark Urban Challenge. And today he's going to tell us about this. Hopefully he'll explain, first of all, how they got this car to be so nice and clean and neat. All other cars had like these sensors all over the place, which were crazy looking. Uh, and secondly, very hopefully tell what happened in the last uh, mission where they somehow lost some of the advantage. So without further ado. Great. Dan. Thanks, Luke. Uh, glad to be here today. So um, I'm happy to take questions along the way. So if people uh, want to stop and interrupt me, that's great. Uh, I spend half my time teaching in a business school. And in the business school, things are very interactive. It's hard to get three words out of your mouth. Um, so I, I hope to answer the couple things Luke mentioned here. So let me just give a little quick overview about the, the, the team. Uh, so we had a fairly small team working on the Urban Challenge, uh, about 13 students, eight of whom really uh, took it on as their full-time activity, uh, and two faculty who were uh, involved as the team co-leads, Mark Campbell and Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, who's up here too, and myself. Uh, we were one of the 10 teams that had the Track A funding from DARPA, so we got a million dollars. And when you're paying students, a uh, million dollars actually goes pretty far in terms of salaries. Uh, didn't go so far in terms of uh, the hardware that we were buying, however. Uh, I think the vehicle in the end is probably about half a million dollars worth of hardware. Um, we were one of the six to finish the competition, as Luke mentioned. We were not one of the top three prize winners, which were Carnegie and, and Stanford and Virginia Tech. Uh, there were 11 teams selected for the final race based on a semifinals uh, that were run just beforehand. DARPA had indicated that they were hoping to run 20 teams in the actual race. There were only 11 that they felt were qualified enough uh, to run the race. And in fact, fairly quickly in the first mission, five of the teams were eliminated. Um, so within about an hour into the race, it was down, down to six. Uh, and there were about 75 teams that received site visits from DARPA in June and July. Uh, be glad you weren't the DARPA program manager who had to go around and visit 75 places and, and, and evaluate, evaluate their vehicles. That was uh, pretty painful. So I want to just say a few things about what, what we view as distinguishing characteristics of, uh, of our approach and, and what we've done at Cornell. So one of the things is that we really did both the design and the development of this vehicle to use it as a subsequent research platform. Um, we, didn't want the, we didn't want the urban challenge to be the end of life for this vehicle. Um, and that somewhat is reflected in some of these design aesthetics, as Luke was pointing out. The thing doesn't look like it's just got a bunch of sensors bolted on the outside. And that's partly because we believe this thing will have about a five-year life as a useful research platform. And if all the sensors are stuck on there like an erector set, and you live in places like upstate New York where it's raining or snowing a lot of the time, very quickly your sensors will have fallen off of your car. So they're, they're pretty well integrated into the vehicle uh, and hidden from view. Also, the team just brought a real sort of uh, engineering elegance uh, kind of uh, outlook. And that, that's reflected not just in the clean appearance of the vehicle, but also in the fact that it, their goal uh, as, as a team among the students was really to make this vehicle drive like it was a human. And in fact, I think that probably the, the, the biggest reward for the students on the team was hanging around in the lounge of the sleazy ambassador hotel uh, one, one night talking to, the race, talking to the chase car drivers and having the chase car drivers say, you know, your car drives more like a human than any other car in the race. And for the students, that was probably the biggest reward that they could have gotten because that was one of their, their big goals. Um, I guess another distinguishing characteristic I didn't write up here, but I should be sure to mention is that uh, Mark and I really were faculty advisors to this team. There wasn't a single technical decision that we made. Um, the students really drove all of the, the technical decisions on the team. Uh, and a couple of those um, technical decisions, I'll just sort of give you a, a, a little heads up at the beginning and then we can look for them as, as I go through the talk. But one thing that we did that uh, no, I think no other team did, or certainly no other team uh, that, that placed well in the race, is all of the actuation was done in-house for our vehicle. 
Uh, most of the other teams used repurposed systems that were uh, human driver assistance for people who, who, who can't operate a vehicle. Um, and I think that in the end, that was by and large a pretty good decision, although it, it did lead to this problem Luke was uh, alluding to at the beginning. Uh, and then the other thing that we did was we did all of our own pose estimation. And that's a place where I think with 2020 hindsight, we should have shelled out the money and bought one of these Aplanix systems, which uh, most of the other teams that did well did. Uh, and you know, you're, you're making all of these decisions along the way, and at the time, it wasn't clear that the Aplanix was really gonna deliver, they did. Um, you know, so I think at the time it was a reasonable decision, but with hindsight, certainly wouldn't do that again. Uh, another big distinguishing characteristic from a technical point of view, and, and therefore what I'll, I'll focus on in the technical part of the talk the most, is that we did a lot of stuff with uh, identification and tracking of objects, uh, which most of the other teams didn't do. So just a sort of quick thing about the vehicle platform. Again, as Luke mentioned, this, this thing is uh, you know, very clean looking. This has a full array of sensors on it like every other vehicle, you just don't see them because so they're IBO sensors embedded in the, uh, uh, LIDARs embedded in the front of the vehicle here. Just sort of some pictures of the steering brake and transmission actuation. Um, they were all done to sort of the National Highway Safety, safety uh, specs. So the steering angle is what will, uh, is, is the amount you can steer and roll, and roll this vehicle over at 35 miles an hour. So it can turn the wheel pretty fast. Um, there, were, there was basically a data center in the back, 17 dual core uh, machines. I don't think we quite win the prize for that. I think MIT had a few more cores in their vehicle than we did, but it was pretty close. Uh, and then uh, in order to, to drive all of that, we had a, a, a big secondary power system uh, that could drive all of the computers and other things uh, in the vehicle. And this, was, this proved to be more important than we hoped it would be. In the qualifying events leading up to the race, DARPA had some trouble with their uh, emergency safety stop. And one of the modes of the emergency safety stop was not just to tell your software to stop, but was to shut the engine of your car off. And of course, when the engine of your car is gone, so is your alternator and so is your air conditioning. Uh, and then after that happened to us due to this malfunction of, of the e-stop system, the, the uh, race of, or the, the qualifier officials spent the better part of an hour scratching their head trying to figure out what to do about it. And our car was sitting there with all the computers running in the desert uh, in, 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 uh, in Victorville. Luckily, it was November instead of August, or I think it wouldn't have lasted. Uh, so the power system held up, and actually the computers held up fine with, uh, without the air conditioning for that hour. The use of mobile processors was pretty key there, because uh, these things generate a lot less heat and, and, and deal better with bad environments like that. Uh, just a, a sort of quick overview also of the sensor system, more, uh, not the details, because we don't have time to go through it, but just to give you a sense of, there's a lot of LIDARs on here, also millimeter, millimeter wave radars, uh, some vision systems. Uh, very important, there's a very high quality inertial navigation unit um, and, uh, and then two different uh, GPS systems. And then we also, uh, for, for uh, odometry of the vehicle, we used the stock uh, wheel encoders that are part of the um, vehicle stability and anti-lock braking system. So we didn't have to uh, add any kind of extra encoders in for that. And in fact, in general, this is pretty much just a stock Tahoe with some stuff added to it. So it's human drivable. Uh, it would almost pass inspection. I think the only thing, at least in New York State, if you have the airbags disabled, you can't pass inspection, but that's about, about it in terms of uh, changes to the vehicle platform. Um, and so this just sort of gives you some sense that there's very good LIDAR coverage out of the front of the vehicle, a little less so out of the back. And I guess the contrast didn't quite show up here. The radars are very th thin, so we get straight out front and then sort of to the sides for merging and a little bit out of the back. Um, so one of the big issues just from sort of the system vehicle platform point of view that, uh, uh, that, that was really important uh, in just sort of getting it out of the way so we didn't have to worry about it was something that had bitten the Cornell team back in 2005 uh, when I was much less involved with things that year, that time, and most of our students were veterans from that program, which is that with all of those sensors, the problem is you, have a, you, you, you can easily end up with a bunch of sort of non-standard inter interfaces to the sensors. and so. That had been a disaster really in 05, and what, uh, what we did as a design this time around was to use a standard uh, custom designed microcontroller to control all of the sensors, put that microcontroller as close as possible uh, to the sensor, sort of short wiring harnesses, and then very quickly just take that data and distribute it out over Ethernet. So all of the data was distributed um, 
using these uh, Ethernet-ready microcontrollers using UDP multicast. Uh, and there were timestamps that were synchronized, gener generated by the micro, so we knew exactly when the data from all these sensors was gathered. Uh, and that was pretty critical for doing any kind of reasonable integration of sensor data. And one of the things that was sort of interesting at a workshop that we had at NIPS recently where uh, a number of the, I, I guess all six teams that completed, all participated in the workshop, is pretty much every team ended up doing something along these lines. Uh, we, all, we weren't communicating with each other during the development because it was a competition, but after, you know, once we got to Victorville, everyone started talking about what they were doing because it was sort of too late to, to, to do anything else. Uh, but everybody really pretty much ended up with some sort of UDP multicast-based distribution of, of their data. Um, so, uh, so I mentioned pose estimation, telling where the vehicle is, is one of the things uh, that we did ourselves. Um, and I think there is one place where uh, there's still something pretty interesting about this. The, the, the really key issue uh, compared to, say, commercial things like a Planix, and that's the use of vision as part of the pose estimator. Um, so a really key issue in, uh, in doing pose estimation for driving and for autonomous control is to avoid sort of big jumps in your estimated pose. So those of you who know much about GPS know that as you pick up and drop satellites, suddenly you may think you're a meter or two laterally from where you just thought you were uh, a second ago. And similarly, there's the same kind of characteristic with the vision-based matching, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're sort of trying to fit lane lines to things here, and every once in a while it'll sort of jump and decide that maybe that piece of, you know, sidewalk or something over there is the lane, and the lanes will jump laterally to the side and then jump back again. So the big issue for, for, the, for the data here is being able to reject these sort of big jumps. And when you have multiple sources, you know, including several GPS, multiple GPS units and vision that you can uh, sort of correlate with each other, actually rejecting these big jumps proves to be something that's not that difficult. Um, yeah. So with, with all of this, basically there's an underlying probabilistic model and there's just a sort of likelihood ratio test of, you know, how likely is it that this is actually a correct measurement given that these other sensors are reporting. Um, and so, but rather than just taking all of those and just putting them together into one estimate, some estimates can be actively rejected. Uh, and then when you sort of, if you watch the output of the system, it'll sort of tell you, you know, I'm, I'm rejecting the septentrio right now because I don't believe it's signal. Um, yeah. So when you uh, implement a particle filter, it happens that uh, particles that, um, which are most probably switch, and if you have these switches, they, they usually coincide with post jumps then. Yeah, so the, the, so the particle filtering here was used um, just for estimating probabilities of what lane the vehicle was in. And there, basically, we had a whole bunch of particles, each uh, estimating probability distribution over the, the, the local road network. So I'll probably slip into urban challenge lingo. So the RNDF is the, is, is the road network uh, definition file. And so the particle filtering wasn't being used uh, for integrating the, 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 the different sensors, but just given that we had a pose estimate and now you want to map the pose information onto the lanes, they're essentially a bunch of particles that are each voting for different possible hypotheses about where you, where you are in the map. What is particle um, So I don't want to go too much into the technical detail or I won't get through, but basically, uh, oh sorry, what is particle filtering? So this is a, this is a, a scheme for handling ambiguity uh, of hypotheses in probabilistic modeling. So for example, if you're doing something like just having, say, a simple Gaussian model, right, you'd sort of average everything together into, into one estimate. The particle filter allows you to have multiple hypotheses that you're maintaining at once, and then pick the highest probability hypothesis rather than, than so you could sort of think of a set of Gaussians, for example, would be a, a simple example of that. And rather than treating those as, say, some mixture, you actually want to allow each of those to exist as separate hypotheses, and then pick the most likely one when you actually have to make a decision. Because the problem with maintaining ambiguity is that's a great idea, except in the end, this vehicle has to do something. <coughs> It can't say, well, I think maybe I'm in this lane and maybe I'm in that lane. Um, so, and, and so one of the things about this is that it's quite accurate in GPS blackouts. Um, and so Isaac Miller, who's the one PhD student who's been involved in this project, uh, has a, a paper coming out in the Robotics and Automation Conference looking at exactly how accurate this is during fairly long GPS blackouts. Um, and this just sort of shows a little test course where it stays uh, right on the sort of same track that you get 
um, without, without the, when the GPS is turned off. Um, so as I said, the main sort of technical part uh, of, of things that I think is, is innovative in what we ended up doing is, is this detection and, and tracking. Um, and so we use a combination of, of LIDAR, which is laser ranging, um, radar, and vision. And I should say a little bit about the LIDAR data. So um, LIDARs come in, in, in various shapes and forms. And uh, my sort of characterization of the state of the art at the time that we were going into the race was that you either had LIDARs that were sort of one scan line or a very small number of scan lines, but, were, but had pretty good range. Or you had LIDARs that might give you more scan lines but were much shorter range. And that's starting to converge now, but at least when we were doing the design, you could either have this very, you know, sort of view of the world where you're sort of cutting the world with one plane, and you can tell the distances to all the objects in that plane, but that's a very impoverished view of the world because it's only one plane. Or you could have a whole bunch of planes intersecting the world getting distances on a bunch of planes, but your distance estimates would be both noisier and not as far away from the vehicle. And so we have a mixture of LIDAR units, some of which uh, are single scan line or small number of scan lines, but can see out 150 to 200 meters, and then others of which see much less far. And so that data needs to be integrated together in, in, in detection and tracking. Then we also used vision for detection and tracking, but it's one of the things that we turned off in the race. Um, so there's a bunch of things that the car does that weren't on for race day. And that's pretty much true of every team, uh, is that they ended up having parts of their uh, system that they decided, eh, a little too risky. Now that we understand what's really likely to happen in the race, we'll turn this bit off. Yeah, William. So if, uh, if a lot of teams were using LiDAR, did you have issues where one car's beam would blind another car? Yeah, so the question is, is with a lot of teams using LiDAR, were there problems with the, the LiDARs blinding each other? So all the teams did some degree of testing of pointing LiDARs at each other. Some teams that had multiple full vehicles could do a better job of that because they actually pointed their two cars at each other. Um, the LiDARs are fairly good at not having that be problematic. But that said, there was a, a, a complete disaster. On the, so the day before the race, uh, uh, in the morning, they had a practice run. And they lined up all 11 vehicles for the race facing a big metal bleacher <laughs> that was empty because there was no audience there. And essentially, everybody's sensing systems died. And nobody really know, you know, there's a lot of active sensing on these things. There's the millimeter range radars, there are the LIDARs. So, but you know, people were bouncing huge amounts of IR off of this large, very reflective surface, and it was coming back. So what they did in the actual race was they put the cars out two or three at a time. And that came from trying this dry one. So there clearly is, some evidence suggesting that there's some kind of interference among these things, but it's not interference that anybody saw in sort of normal operating conditions. But when you took 11 of these vehicles and pointed them all at a highly, not only reflective, but you know, strangely uh, uh, variegated surface, so things were bouncing off in all directions, it definitely caused issues. Um, so there is, there, there, and, and this is an issue with active sensing in general, that there's always the opportunity for uh, um, for interference, and you know, one of the things that I think is a big lesson for us at a high level out of this is that you really want to be integrating a lot of different sensor sources that have different failure modes. So vision may have too many false positives and negatives. We're going to try to work on that to get it down to where it's usable, but it's not going to be as susceptible to interference of this form. But clearly, the active sensors are, are really good when you can use them because they, they get a lot more out of the environment than, than passive sensing like vision. So you had a... Yes, I just going to ask about the vision. Uh, what do you mean by vision? Is it 2D vision, 3D vision? So the vision we were doing was 2D. I think there's some interesting opportunities to do more 3D vision with this Velodyne uh, sensor that I mentioned, uh, or, or I alluded to, which is, uh, it's a 64 scanline LiDAR unit, and you actually get quite good intensity information back in addition to range off of the, off of the, uh, uh, off of the lasers. And so you get range data that's perfectly aligned with your intensity data, which is really nice. Um, it's still only 64 scan lines high, um, and it's all 360 degrees around. Uh, but, but I think there's a real opportunity to look, look at some of that data. But we were doing 2D vision uh, and two different uh, approaches. We'd done some target detection work of our own, and we also were using a commercially provided system. Uh, and basically just there was not an operating point that, that was reasonable uh, given the kind of environment we were in. Um, and 
unlike, you know, and, 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 and of course, the ideal goal one would go for is what we achieved with the, um, with the pose estimator, which is that when you have some reasonable characterization of the kinds of errors that the units are, that, that, that the different uh, sensors are giving you, you can actually reject them as being bad. Uh, we never got to that stage with the obstacle, de obstacle detection. So, uh, based on what you were just saying about the variable, do you have any people on your team working on security in the sense of uh, is someone actively attempting to lie to me about the surroundings by erecting a funny looking obstacle causing these data to yeah, so the question's about just, you know, given that these things can be actively uh, interfered with, or is anyone in our, and in fact, so I should say, you know, our team is sort of now history, and I think that's true of all of the teams. Uh, but we do have a, a, a smaller group that's working on, on research growing out of this. Um, I think most of the people who spent two years of their life working full time on this <laughs> wanted a break. Um, but. Uh, but so we're not actively looking at interference with these units at this point because, or you know, with people trying to disrupt the behavior. Our view is that when you're in a friendly environment, things are still hard enough at the moment. Uh, and so those are the problems we're working on. But I think when you get into sort of hostile environments where someone's trying to interfere with the vehicle, that, that's yet another set of research challenges. But even in a friendly environment where there's a lot of clutter, uh, you know, sort of more clutter than the urban challenge, it's, it's a problem these days. I mean, so cities have always had traffic lights for humans. So in a city that's set up for autonomous vehicles, what would you put in as the cheapest, most reliable system on every street corner to help the vehicle out? Well, so I mean, so, so, so Raman's uh, sort of question was about passive versus active sensing and then this issue of traffic lights and, and what would you do to sense traffic lights sort of cheaply and reliably. Um, what I, what, what, what I might have done before is, is, is a mixture of IR and vision sensing. Um, but the problem is traffic lights are getting replaced with these OLEDs that don't actually emit that much heat. <laughs> They're too efficient. Uh, so the IR is not gonna work as well uh, as, as, as a secondary sensor. Um, so I think that probably the right thing is to put emitters of some kind. Uh, and there, you know, I think there are a lot of solutions to different sorts of emitters for traffic lights. Um, you know, I mean, literally spread spectrum radio signal. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things you can do that don't, don't require sensing, and that's probably the right thing to do if you had a lot of autonomous vehicles. So I do want to move on, so one more. Well, just a comment on what you in your response. Um, I think it's a mistake for any vehicle that has this much, any, any machine that has this much power and autonomy being attached to it to assume that there is such a thing as a friendly environment. Um, I'm not talking war zones, I'm just talking uh, malicious individuals, uh, criminals, oh, yeah. uh, kids I agree. playing pranks. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, for these things to be released in the wild, a lot would have to be done. Um, and that would include sort of safety and security systems. The way this car is driven at the moment, it's basically uh, a huge user assistance device, right? There is a human driver sitting in the driver's seat, and he or she can take control of the vehicle. And, you know, they basically have a sort of dead man switch to kill it, but they also can just you know, grab the wheel or put their foot on the brake. The way we did the automation, it doesn't preclude a human driver from, from, from just taking over. Now, of course, when DARPA ran the race, they didn't want any humans anywhere near the car, but then they were pretty careful. I don't know if anyone saw any of the stuff from Victorville, but they're the, the you know, K-rails, the big concrete barriers that uh, are used on like freeway construction projects and that kind of stuff, isolating off all of the places where the autonomous vehicles were driving where there was any chance of pedestrians. So, you know, like DARPA had DARPA officials out on the course and they were all surrounded by K barriers. Um, so I think that to take these things and put them in places where there could be any reasonable chance of them driving autonomously with people around, you have to be a lot more careful, absolutely. Um, uh, wait. So, oh yeah, okay, so this, this was on the, on the tracking stuff. So, so I'm gonna just sort of skip through this a little faster than I'd intended because I wanna get to showing some, some videos uh, from various things. Um, but basically, uh, the LiDAR data itself really needs to be segmented before it's worth very much for object detection. Uh, and then we have techniques for determining how many objects there are, and then sort of solving the kind of data association problem of am I updating some estimate of an object I previously had or initializing a new one? Uh, 
And then as we estimate the track objects, we not only estimate tracks for objects, but we estimate certain metadata about them, like is this thing vehicle-like, is it stopped, is it moving, et cetera. Uh, and then as I said before, maintaining stable track IDs over time is something that, that, uh, that we did. So this just shows uh, the, the raw LIDAR hits, which are these sort of individual points here. Uh, this is just from a four scan line LIDAR, the IBO unit, uh, looking out of the front of the car. So the colors here are the heights of, the, of which are the four scan lines. And then we've sort of drawn boxes around things that, that, that are clusters of points that lie together. And we have a, a simple criterion for deciding whether a cluster is stable, which is based on just uh, clustering together points using two different sorts of separation thresholds of half a meter and a meter. And if they're the same, if you get the same cluster, it's stable. And if you get different clusters, it's unstable. And these are chosen based on the fact that we knew that vehicles had to be about a meter apart. Right, so DARPA actually had constraints that said vehicles shouldn't get closer than one meter from anything. Um, and then, even if you, and so this picture just illustrates that out of all these clusters, these little couple red boxes here are the only stable ones. So you get a huge data reduction just by doing some simple sort of stability criterion on the clusters. But when you've got these clusters and you want to start matching them over time, um, just the issue of what are stable measurements from the clusters is a completely non-trivial one. So you might think, okay, I've got a box, I'll take the center of the box or the, or, the, or the bounding box itself, or I'll use the center of mass of the set of points. The problem is these are very unstable things to take out of the data because as uh, you're moving with respect to something else, you start seeing very, very different points and things like the center of mass and the bounding box change size radically. Um, and so the particular techniques we developed are to, to use the occluding contours where you sort of see the edges of the, of, of the object as disappearing and the closest point. And those prove to be pretty stable, but it means that there are various things that we can see that we won't get estimates from because we're assuming we have both occluding contours. So if you see an object that's partly hidden from view, we're not gonna be able to estimate uh, things about what, it's, uh, about what it's doing very well. So the other thing that was really critical in getting uh, targets out of the LIDAR data is to have a reasonable estimate of where the ground is. Um, in the LIDAR data, you're getting these, these clusters of points back. And you know, people are great at looking at the LIDAR data and saying, yep, this is an object, nope, that's background. Uh, but not so easy in the, in the raw data itself in terms of algorithms. And so what we did is to have a, a model of what the height of the ground is everywhere and then things that were above the ground by more than a certain height or obstacles that we were interested in. And the Velodyne, because it gives us, so this actually shows these dark blue lines here uh, are, the, are the actual Velodyne data. So you can sort of see what the 64 scan lines going outward look like from the vehicle. And then you can sort of, um, sort of grow out from those locations by minimizing, because you're looking for the lowest stuff in the environment, uh, by minimizing height, and then that gives you a, a ground model. But there are always regions where you're not getting any hits back at all for whatever reasons. Uh, either because you're off the top of the LIDAR or because of the way the vehicle's pitched with respect to things. So here there was something higher further away that did get a few hits, but a region in the middle where there were no hits. And then you can take these and project them forward over time because you know the ego motion of the vehicle and get a pretty good ground model over time. Um, so in doing the, the tracking of the objects, um, we we uh, represent each object in its own coordinate frame and then store the observed LIDAR data points and, and other data of things like the, uh, the radars give us back point information also. Uh, and then we keep a 2D rigid body transform uh, that says how that object is, is changing over time and that's uh, relative. Uh, and then ground speed is absolute because we really care how fast that vehicle's going and not just its motion relative. Uh, and then heading. And then we just use common filtering to, which is sort of standard thing for this kind of uh, scenario for uh, predicting the point locations forward. And then when we get the new data, we just update the coordinate frame and our velocity estimates. And one of the key things is we throw all the data away on each frame. So once we've decided which new data points belong to an object, uh, those become the new data for the, for the, uh, for the model. We again use particle filtering to represent alternative hypotheses, but here it's a very small number of particles. So basically, the problem that you have is that if you have several objects that are near each other, there's a data association problem. 
you know, which object at which time corresponds to which one at the other time. We need some small amount of ambiguity to be able to represent those hypotheses. And so we use a, a small number in the urban challenge, we used four particles to represent. So each particle is a hypothesis about all of the objects in the world and which objects they came from at the previous time. And then, um, and then we use four of those to, to maintain some amount of ambiguity in, in, uh, in the tracking. So, so we, when we do sort of uh, integration and fusion of data, we do this all at the object tracking level. Um, so this is all at the level of, of objects and not trying to do things like integrate the ra radar and LIDAR data together globally. We only do this for the, uh, for the things that we've identified as, as being trackable <coughs> objects. And to start new tracks, things have to meet certain requirements. So as I said, uh, I think I mentioned before, the LIDAR, we need, if we're gonna start a track with LIDAR data, we need to see two occluding contours. We need to see sort of both edges of the object and not have it be partly hidden and emerging from behind something else. Um, on the other hand, for radar, if we've got a hit, we, we, start a, uh, we start a track. In the urban challenge, there were often about 50 simultaneous targets. So this is just a, a picture of, um, of one of the uh, um, things at the qualifying event where there were two lanes of traffic moving around. So each of these are track targets. Green means we think it's moving. Red means we think it's stopped. This is our ego vehicle. Um, and I should have a, uh, just a video of this. So this, uh, one of the guys on the team called this uh, Ford Taurus Frogger. So you can see these are a bunch of Ford Tauruses. They're driving by the front of our vehicle as we're looking here. You can see that there's a K barrier directly in front of us. So right along the side of this, there's a K barrier. And basically you have to sit here and wait until there's enough of a gap to pull out and we're supposed to turn left across the oncoming traffic and then out. So here we decided there's enough room. Um, we're moving along. So again, in the video here, it's small, but you can sort of, you know, there's not much here. Um, so you can see the car going around. And, you know, we're going pretty close to these other vehicles. These are not wide lanes, given the, <laughs> the width of the vehicle that we're driving. Um, so coming around the top here, now the next thing we're gonna have to do is make a left-hand turn again across oncoming traffic. We don't have a stop sign here. We slow <coughs> down, we wait. You can see a vehicle sort of appeared out of nowhere there, and it's because it had been occluded by another car. Make the turn across. And so the way, the, this was probably the hardest thing in the whole urban challenge. This was the area A qualifiers. Um, and so what you had to do was make as many laps here as you could in 30 minutes. And if you cut somebody off, if you pulled out too soon and they had, the, the, they were human drivers and all those Ford Tauruses and they had to jam their brakes on, they honked. And you had to get as many honk free laps as possible. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and, and every team got two runs, I think, on this. Um, and, uh, and on the second, so this was actually from our second day running on this. And then Tony Tether, the DARPA director, was there basically saying, you're in, you're out, um, <laughs> as, as, as the teams were running around this course. So it was uh, kind of interesting. Um, so in addition to, to so, so, so the object tracking there is really important for being able to tell when there's enough time to pull in uh, in, in front of other vehicles. Um, but one of the other things that, that our system does is it actually maintains identifiers on those objects across time to allow us to try to do things like reason about the vehicles over longer time periods. Um, and so here again, we use sort of a standard kind of approach of uh, doing uh, maximum likelihood estimation from frame to frame. Again, using these sort of stab stable measures, the closest point and occlusion bearings. Um, and so again here, that's the same kind of uh, picture from before, but in this little movie I'll show, and I'm not sure, probably the screen resolution is not going to be quite good enough, but we'll see. So can you, see, yeah, I think maybe, so you see there's a 116 on that car up ahead of us. So, you know, as we drive around, and again here, this gives you a little sense of what things looked like in Victorville. I mean, it's sort of a suburban environment. In some ways, it's the DARPA suburban challenge. I mean, this was a residential area. By the way, we didn't see this area until uh, right before the race. Our car spent five days driving through here and we'd never been in it um, during the qualifiers. I mean, we saw a video like this of it off of our vehicle, but we, we didn't see the place. So you can see we're following along here um, and that ID is still staying 116 throughout time. The vehicle behind us actually changed IDs once during this sort of minute and a half run. Uh, and we have a lot less sensing out of the back of the vehicle. Um, and so the ability to do this stable identification. And you know, knowing things about the fact that you're tracking the same vehicle over time 
can be very useful. And in fact, I'll show you in a second uh, scenarios at four-way stop signs, knowing which vehicles are which can be, can be quite important. Um, so, so as I said, the sort of, uh, in addition to actually doing tracking, we also, for higher level planning, want to know things like, you know, is this a car? Is it stopped or not? And so here we use just uh, simple two-state hidden Markov models on certain data like, you know, width of the point clusters and, and speed. Uh, whether something's occluded or not, uh, we use geometric reasoning for that. Uh, and then lane probabilities, we have, to, we have to assign lane probabilities for the other vehicles. For example, if there's a vehicle coming at you and you think it's in your lane, your behavior is very different than if there's a vehicle coming at you and you think it's in the opposing lane. And those aren't very far away from each other, right? Your lane and the opposing lane is a, a, a few meter lateral shift, and yet your behavior is going to be completely different. So, um, and so it's, it's, it's really important to, 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 to have a reasonable estimate of what's going on with respect to the map. Now, there's a sort of, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a way to get this fatally wrong. Um, and the, and the, way, uh, the, the way to get this fatally wrong is to therefore do all your reasoning with respect to the map. Since you need to know where other vehicles are with respect to the map, let's just throw everything into the map. And the problem is the map's not necessarily accurate. Your estimate of where you are on the map isn't necessarily accurate. And so if you're going to only reason about other vehicles with respect to the map, when you're really perceiving them with respect to yourself and then mapping them into the, in, 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 into the map frame, that's a bad idea. Because if something's coming at you at some point, you don't really care where it is on the map. <laughs> If it's close enough to you, you want to be taking evasive action. And so, so there's a real challenge in the representation for these kinds of systems is simultaneously having some representation with respect to a map like this and some representation that's just local with respect to the vehicle. Um, and being able to, and now you've got two representations and you want to do something coherent that's, that's consistent. Um, but, but we and most other teams that did reasonably in the race ended up dealing with this by having both um, a map-based representation and, and, a, and a local vehicle-centric one. So, so this, um, if my little mouse will appear, so this shows uh, area C at the qualifiers, and then I'll get to some video from the race itself in a minute. But, so this is again at the qualifiers. We're pulling up to an intersection here. And you can see there are one, two, three cars already parked. These little L shapes are the actual LIDAR hits, and then these are the and, and at a four-way stop, you have to reason about the fact that these guys are all here first, so you have to wait. DARPA counts to five, and then lets this car go. You can see green. And that one flicked purple for a minute, which meant that we knew it was occluded, um, because, of course, it disappeared. Uh, now this one goes. You can watch this one. It'll flip purple, and then back to red. I guess the purple-red distinction is not so clear here. So we realize that this vehicle is still there. It's not something that appeared because it was occluded. Then this one goes, and it's time for us to go. And you can see here these tracks sort of splitting up in some weird ways. There are some blind points out of the side and rear of the vehicle, and we're not so good at tracking an object consistently through time as it goes past there. And so then the vehicle goes on. So in many ways, these tests of, of, of the merging in, you know, the sort of video frogger and the intersections were actually harder than what happened in the competition itself. So DARPA set up a set of qualifiers that were quite rigorous. Um, and I think it's partly because, you know, in many ways, this event was, uh, was uh, a public relations event as much as anything else. And I don't mean that in the negative sense. I mean, I think it, everyone who participated in this thing, regardless of how they did, feels that it was an unbelievable opportunity to be able to participate in it. But it really was geared towards sort of the public learning more about these kinds of vehicles. And so I think DARPA wanted to be pretty darn sure that the vehicles behaved well before the race day. And so they made the qualifiers even tougher than, than the race itself. Um, so just sort of a comment about tracking versus occupancy. I believe we're the only team that did tracking as opposed to sort of reasoning about the world by just sort of looking at what's out there around the vehicle and doing that both vehicle-centric and with respect to a map. Um, and you know, currently we have that kind of at the level required for this intersection precedence. But of course, you could do intersection precedence also by just sort of drawing a box at each stop line and saying, well, if there's something in, the, if, if that box was full before I got there and it's still full now, there's you know, somebody else is there with precedence over me. So you don't need to do vehicle tracking to solve that kind of problem. But you know, the problem is, as you get sort of uh, you know, more complicated behaviors, 
it's good to actually have a notion of an object over time and identity. Um, but that's not to say we've solved that problem. I mean, you know, as you get longer time periods and you get the kind of change in shape that happens as things move with respect to each other, the, the tracking has problems also. But this is definitely a, a research direction that we're very interested in, of using tracking to reason about the world around us. Um, and I'll also mention in our little fender bender with MIT in the final race that uh, this sort of tracking, I think, is really crucial to pre preventing those kinds of problems. So, um, so just a little bit about, uh, you know, I've been focusing on the perception stuff largely because I'm a perception guy. Um, let me just say a little bit about the uh, uh, decision-making stuff. So we had a three-level uh, architecture, one sort of which we called behavioral, which is kind of macro-level planning, right? This is sort of, you know, Google Maps, right? It's a map and find me a route from A to B. Um, then the tactical sort of local planning is deciding things like when should I change lanes? When should I pass somebody? Uh, you know, when should I merge into an intersection? Uh, and then the operational layer is the sort of plan execution, generating paths and obstacle avoidance. And almost every team had some multi-level, at least two and probably three level set of AI that kind of made sure that the, at least this low level path planning was separated from the higher level sort of reasoning about what the vehicle would be and should be doing. So this is really a state machine here. And then this, uh, in the way we implemented it, is a, is a gigantic nonlinear optimizer. So the operational layer um, does constrained nonlinear optimization. It starts out with some base path that comes from the map, some set of constraints that come from things like sensed lane boundaries uh, or lane boundaries from the map itself, uh, some set of target paths about where we're trying to get to, starting and, 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 and heading positions, things about obstacles. And then it tries to uh, interpolate a smooth path through there uh, just by setting up a big, a big nonlinear optimization problem. And this is really the root of the vehicle's ability to drive more like a human. Because it takes all these constraints and throws them together, and one of the, set, one of the very strong sets of constraints is about the smoothness of the final path. And people tend to drive very smooth paths. Um, and this is done just using a, 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 an off-the-shelf nonlinear solver called LOCO. Um, and this planning is done, in fact, almost all the high-level planning is done at about a 10 hertz rate. Um, so this sort of shows a, a picture for the path planning constraints. So this, and I'll show another little movie here, this is an area that, again, from the qualifiers that they called the gauntlet, uh, because there are a bunch of cars parked on both sides and you have to sort of swerve through them. Um, so this shows a slightly different view than what we've been seeing before. These are sort of uh, convex holes around sets of points sensed in the environment. This is where the path planner is trying to go. These are the lane boundary constraints here and here, and you can see here that they sort of dart in, and that's because there's an obstacle here. And so the, the, the path planner is now going to try to find a good nonlinear path given this heading of the vehicle here, the desired heading coming out of the path there, uh, and this set of constraints around the boundary. And it just sort of keeps planning that forward at a planning horizon that depends on the speed at which the vehicle's moving. Um, so again here, this is a, a little video of this. Um, so you can see here we're approaching a car. It's on the right, which is going to be there. There, suddenly the constraint appears. And you can see the car very smoothly sort of steers around. And then it's going to steer back. It looks like we crossed the yellow line there because of where the camera is. But in fact, the vehicle stayed on its side. Now there's some barrels in the middle. We're going to swerve a little to the right. Now we're going to swerve a little to the left again. And you can see the constraints keep coming up here. But you get this very smooth path, even though you have these discrete events, right? These constraints suddenly pop in and appear but you don't jerk the wheel around because you're doing this nice nonlinear optimization to find a smooth path through here. Uh, and so it gives, uh, so this was one of the places where um, we definitely had issues when we went through this the first time. We thought this was just blocked because of the way these cars were parked and that we couldn't get through. Um, and so to get through the second time around, we, we reduced our clearances a lot by how, about how close we were willing. So we passed within about 20 centimeters of some of these parked cars um, at you know, 20 miles an hour. Uh, but in, 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 in the words of, uh, of, 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 of someone from DARPA, well, I can drive a Chevy Tahoe down that at 20 miles an hour. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so I, guess, I guess our AI can now, too. Um, but, but that raises some issues that we'll see uh, in, 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 in the final race and some of the things that happened there. So the last part of the high-level stuff uh, is, is the higher-level planning. Um, so the tactical planner. Uh, has different, uh, it's a big state machine, it's got different, so it's got sort of road reasoning, intersection reasoning, zones, which are sort of parking lots and big places where you don't quite know what's going on. 
and blockages. Uh, the whole design for this was being able to recover from places you didn't know where you were um, because the vehicle might start up in strange conditions. And, and this, in fact, uh, was a big problem for stuff that happened in the 2005 challenge. Um, but the idea is that the vehicle sort of has these octants around it and it has little sort of software monitors that are responsible for telling what's going on in different places. And so if you're in, say, in a stay in lane behavior, there's a forward, forward monitor here which is gonna monitor the distance to the nearest vehicle in front of you. So that you're staying in lane trying to drive the speed you want to, but you have to keep a safe distance from the vehicle in front. Um, and so this is a nice sort of example of the stay in lane and, and change lane behaviors. Uh, this is from the actual final event. Um, we're p this is a place, a two lane in each direction road uh, known as Phantom. And uh, we're coming up behind a chase vehicle and an autonomous vehicle here. This is University of Central Florida. And you can see we changed lanes as we saw that vehicle out there. We're going about 35 miles an hour. They're going about 15. The speed here is about 35. Um, you can see that we're catching up. There's our chase vehicle behind us. Um, Right now, we only see the, the rearmost vehicle. Uh, and in another there, that's the, that's the vehicle in front. So this is the chase vehicle. And the, 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 chain, the lane change behavior wants to change back to the right lane, but it realizes that this gap here is not a reasonable gap to pull into. So it keeps going. And then as soon as it sees a big enough gap, then it's gonna do a smooth lane change back. And, and you know, the low level uh, operational layer that we just talked about is what makes that be smooth. Right, the, the high level planner here that was saying change lanes to get around this slow moving vehicle, change back, just has these discrete pass, stay in lane, return to lane, and the, the smooth path planner is responsible for making that smooth. But you deal with opposing traffic during that kind of maneuver. You have the sensing range for that? Yeah, so, um, so the, issue, the question was how do we deal with opposing traffic during that kind of maneuver? Um, we only pass moving vehicles when we have another traffic lane in our direction in the map. Um, we do pass stopped vehicles, even if we have to pull into an opposing lane, but we don't pass moving vehicles. And that was part of the DARPA rules, was that you didn't do a moving pass, you didn't pass a moving vehicle going on the wrong side of the road. Um, the sensing horizon here is, with the, with the radars, is far enough though that at 35 miles an hour, if we had good radar coverage, you'd probably be fine but our radar coverage is not so great. We have only five of them and only one is, only five on the front bumper and they're, they're looking more sideways for merging than they are forward. Um, so, so in the final event, uh, there were three missions with a total of about 56 miles. Uh, we completed that in five hours and 53 minutes of autonomous driving. Um, and about half of the time was spent in the third mission. So as Luke mentioned, we looked like we were doing great in the first mission, pretty good in the second mission, and so pathetically in the third mission, I wanted to hide under a rock. Well, he didn't say that, but I'll, that's how I felt on that day. <laughs> I was like, no, not after all that good performance earlier. Um, but, uh, but what happened was um, we had a sort of intermittent problem, and I must say, this race really to me was about two things. Uh, it was about software, it was about <coughs> testing. Uh, and not software testing, but testing, testing, like testing the whole uh, integrated system. Uh, and you know, I think we did pretty well on the software side. I think we didn't do that great on the testing side. And we had a sort of intermittent throttle problem that we had seen occur, but it usually didn't occur until several hours of autonomous driving, which makes it fairly hard to debug. We thought we'd fixed it. We obviously hadn't. And when this throttle problem happens, the vehicle, the AI will be commanding the vehicle to go at some speed, but the throttle actuator will only run at the engine idle speed, which in the Tahoe is about five miles an hour, uh, unless you happen to have it happen when you're, say, in second gear, and then you go faster, right? Because it's just the idle speed. But if you're in first gear at idle, it's, it goes about five miles an hour. Um, and uh, so that's what sort of uh, killed us at the end there. But I must say, I mean, really, you know, Having completed the race to me is, is a great thing. Uh, you know, whether we did it that fast or not, I don't know. This is still annoying, but it is what it is. Uh, test more. Uh, and, 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 and I was sort of the, you know, the test junkie of the group anyway. I mean, I was sort of, my job was to keep beating everybody up and test more, but it still wasn't enough. Uh, so the race, there were hundreds of interactions with other vehicles, um, right? I mean, we went through on the order of, uh, you know, 100 four-way stop signs, most of which had other vehicles present. 
Um, some of them are pretty interesting, which I'll, I'll touch on here. So it was a traffic jam in the first mission, which was caused by University of Central Florida, which is one of the teams that was in but was disqualified pretty soon after uh, this mishap, where they stopped at an intersection for about 10 minutes. Um, and uh, there was another interesting one with a stunt driver, a human being, going the wrong way down a one-way road. That was kind of cool. Uh, we dealt pretty well with that. And then there's our, our collision with MIT. So the traffic jam is kind of an interesting one because I think it, it, it points to this need to do much better planning ahead and, and, and to have a perceptual system that can, that can enable that. So here we're pulling up behind a whole bunch of stopped cars. And in fact, that vehicle was still moving when we pulled up behind it. Uh, this just again shows this sort of view uh, that we've been seeing all along. As we pulled out to start to pass, oops, <laughs> somebody else came along. Um, then uh, we sort of pulled way over to the side of the road here. So if you look and see what's going on here, uh, we can't get back into our lane after we pass, so we're just going to pull way over and try to let other people be able to get by. Uh, little Ben, the, the Penn Lehigh team, does in fact come by while we're there. And then eventually UCF decides to go, um, and, and we pull out. So in, in this traffic jam, I think the thing that's sort of interesting here is we made very local decisions. We decided to pass a stopped vehicle, uh, and then by the time we pulled out, the gap that we could have pulled back into closed because the stopped vehicle moved forward. Um, and this shows that you know, if we'd been doing better tracking and reasoning about behaviors over time, the fact, you know, if you pull up to a line of cars, and the last vehicle still moving as you pull up, you're not going to pass that last car, right? I mean, unless you're a really type A driver. But I mean, the point is you're not, you're not going to get anywhere. There was a whole bunch of stopped cars, and this last guy stopped far enough to leave you a little gap, and then he sort of rolled forward later. Um, and you know, so that kind of reasoning means we needed to be able to say that car that is stopped now we saw moving, he's not the problem. Passing him is probably not a good idea. If we want to get out of here, let's make a U-turn and replant. And the problem is, once we started passing, it's pretty hard to back up now when we're in this one-lane place with cars on the other side, and it wasn't wide enough to make a U-turn, so we were sort of stuck. Um, so the ability to reason further ahead is, is, is important. Um, so here's the, the, the wrong way car. There was this traffic driver, as I mentioned, who, who sort of got lost and was going the wrong way. Uh, he was moving up the hill as we first came down. And uh, I'm not quite sure what would have happened if he'd still been moving when we got near him. Probably we would have stopped and pulled as far over to the right as possible. That's what we should have done. But by the time we got there, he was stopped. And so we just passed him as a static obstacle. Um, and we didn't actually slow down and, and stop because of him. Um, but we should have if he'd still been moving when we got there. So this is just a, so DARPA put some dirt tracks in various places to um, connect various parts of the course together. You can see the earth and berms on both sides. This just sort of cuts further down. You can also see why cameras don't always work so well. Uh, there that guy is parked on the side. And so here, this is Ego moving this way, um, following that vehicle, and there was the parked vehicle. And if that vehicle had been moving instead of parked, our higher level reasoning would have said, hey, there's someone coming at you in your lane. Stop and get as far over as you can. But we didn't get close enough. He stopped moving beforehand, and, and we kept going. So, so I think the the, the maybe most interesting uh, interaction was MIT and us had a little bit of a fender bender in the third race. Uh, we were the two vehicles out on the course the longest. Um, and we were having an issue uh, at a stop sign where we had a, a sort of stop and go behavior um, because there was a K rail that was kind of far out into the lane and we thought that the lane was, was blocked. So MIT tried to pass us. Um, and first they tried to pass us where there was a two lane segment uh, but then it narrowed down to a single lane. Then it came to an intersection, but they sort of kept trying to, to inch their way around. And by the time they came alongside us, we had no reasonable estimate of their speed. And so we sort of, you know, in our stop and go behavior, happened to hit one of our go moments, just as they were beside us trying to pull into the same lane and the two cars just drove right into each other. Now, the reason I think this is interesting in terms of future research questions is that um, the, uh, if we'd been able to reason about them over time, like if MIT had tracked our car over the two minutes or so that they were trying to pass us, they would have realized we weren't stopped. We were stopping and going. And they would have given us a much wider berth and not just pulled right in front of what they thought was a stopped obstacle. Similarly, 
if we knew that this vehicle coming from behind, was the same vehicle that was coming from behind us and was trying to pass us, reasoning about that behavior over time, we would have been much more conservative about what we were doing. And I think if, you know, other than the bozos on the freeway who you see, who seem to be swerving in and out, paying only attention to the one car immediately in front of them, most of us drive with some degree of awareness of the vehicles around us and what those vehicles are doing over time. Uh, and that's a very important part of both good defensive driving and reasonable offensive driving. Uh, and that's not something that these vehicles have the capacity to do right now. So this just sort of shows uh, in the LIDAR data our view of the world and MIT's view of the world. And you can see that we have this K rail very close to the vehicle to the right here. Uh, and then there's MIT just to our left. And we don't have any good velocity estimate of them here. And oh, you know, the world looks nice and clear out in front. <laughs> And so we just start moving that way because there's stuff on both sides, but they're, they're, they came like this and they're turning in front of us and we don't understand that trajectory. So, um, so this may be a little too washed out to see, we'll see. Uh, this is a mixture of some video from, we don't have good video of this happening other than from the tent uh, where DARPA was projecting uh, their video. But you can see we're sort of stopped here, stopping going. There's MIT coming around us. They turn in front of us and smack the two cars go. So this is just showing again sort of what looks like is happening from the point of view of, uh, so that's them. And so, you know, we saw them, they saw us. It's not a question of seeing. It's a question of not understanding enough about the behavior of multiple moving objects in the environment. And so we're in the process of analyzing in a lot of detail exactly what happened here, and MIT and us are jointly going to write a, a paper describing this incident. So there will be, you know, it's like there's always an academic opportunity out of anything. <laughs> Although it, at the moment it happened, I think both of us were, oh no, but, and so both vehicles drove away, you know, they separated the vehicle, both of our recovery teams went out, separated the vehicles, and there we are pulling away. So there was no actual damage that prevented them from completing the race, which was a good thing. So, you know, my main goal going into this was to finish the race and not to get, not to destroy anyone else's car. Uh, <laughs> um, or God forbid any humans, but I was pretty sure DARPA was going to set things up so that there wouldn't be much risk to humans. Um, and, uh, and so we, you know, we came close to, to that, but, but not completely. So just to, to finish up here, just a couple things about some lessons learned. As I said, this is largely about software and systems testing this race. Um, the accurate uh, distribution and time stamping of data was critical. Uh, the multiple sensing modalities and a good ground model are really crucial to being able to make these things work reliably. And I think that should be a combination of active and passive sensing. Although in the end, we and almost every other team ended up relying either largely or completely on the active sensors in the actual race. Um, the only passive sensing we did in the race was for road finding, uh, not for vehicle finding. Uh, this was sort of an interesting one to me. I didn't really believe when we went into this that this constrained nonlinear optimizer was going to be ready enough and mature enough for doing the planning uh, of, 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 the path, of the path planning. And it produces really nice, smooth paths. Uh, in fact, I, I invite anyone who just happens to be in Ithaca, New York, to come drive in our car. It's, a, it's, it's actually not a nauseating experience um, that the car drives quite smoothly. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I think this sort of track metadata and going beyond occupancy models toward behaviors is a really important direction for future research. I think another very important direction, which I didn't touch on too much, is just this sort of deterministic state machine-based high-level reasoning that we were doing is very delicate. And this is clearly not the way to go for, for more complicated kinds of environments. Um, so uh, here's just sort of a list of the people involved in the roles they had and, and, and our main sponsors, and I'm happy to take more questions. Some fraction of machines went down. Can you recover from that? So the question was, suppose, say, during a collision or, in fact, any other time, some fraction of the machines went down, can we recover? Um, most of the system is stateless. So the only bit of state is actually stored in the very highest level planning module, which is keeping track of what goals we've achieved in the mission so far. Um, and so the system was pretty robust to things dying and then starting up again. It might take us some time to recover. And if machines crashed at a time when, you know, the vehicle was in the middle of doing something, it might do something bad in the interim. But essentially the way we designed it was that the very lowest level controllers, if they stopped getting commands from the high level, they'd shut the vehicle down. So that if the crash 
got you to a state where you weren't commanding the vehicle. It's, so several teams had problems where they just kept doing their last commanded control. Uh, I don't know if some of you saw, there's a, I think there's even a video of it on, 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 on YouTube, but Georgia Tech had a, a, a problem that was really sad in that area A where they waited and waited for the vehicles to go by. Finally, they, they got a gap, they pulled out, but instead of turning, they just smashed into the K-rail at sort of the acceleration to try to pull into 10 mile an hour. And, it, it, and all the sensors are in the front of these vehicles. So it was, it, was, it, was, it was a very sad thing. But what had happened is something had crashed and they were just maintaining their last commanded, uh, their last command. So, so if you have some low level fail safe that shuts things down if it's not getting commands, uh, and, and then a stateless system design, pretty much you could shut off any computers you wanted to in the car. Uh, you know, m modulo the fact that if you're going at 30 miles an hour, it's gonna take the car a while to stop and you're stopping blind, right? It's just applying maximum braking force. Uh, but other than that, uh, not, not really a problem. For various reasons, we didn't actually um, persistently write the little bit of state out. So if the highest level module had crashed, we would have started the mission over. But that was a very small, very well debugged piece of code. So, and it at least ran for six hours. We've never seen that piece of code actually crash. I guess the computer it was on could have crashed. Uh, do you guys use some kind of synchronization mechanism to, uh, for clock drift and, and so forth? I mean, basically, how do you keep time? So, so the question was, how do we keep time? Pretty much everything is clocked off of one central clock. So there's, an, there's, a, there's a, this uh, Northrop Grumman Lytton in, um, inertial navigation unit in the system that also generates a very high accuracy clock pulse. And that clock pulse is distributed to all the microcontrollers and all the data is time stamped with that. And so the data is then all just distributed out on, this, uh, on, on the network, but it's all got consistent timestamps and basically everything, you can sort of look at the system as being an event driven system where the events are the data. And since the data is all timestamped with very high degree of synchronization, that's what we end up synchronizing on. So if the IMU's clock pulse were to die, that's definitely a single point of failure. It's one that we've seen happen actually because we, um, how much dirty laundry should I air? Uh, we, we, we made a modification that was gonna have no effect whatsoever. Uh, about a week before the qualifiers, which caused the IMU to stop generating its clock pulse. Um, it, it was fixed and we also had a spare IMU, but we didn't want to go into the race without a spare IMU. So, um, but that is definitely a single point of failure is, 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 is that clock pulse synchronization. One, one or two more we've got. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Dick. Yeah, Dan, uh, humans managed to drive just passive sensors, but you it seems like most of these teams have given up on vision and they've oh, well, resorted to LIDAR and radar for no one's what. Is there any chance of actually making your vision work for these kinds of tasks? So, 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 so uh, Dick's question, for those who didn't hear it, is, uh, you know, humans drive with just passive sensors. It seems like most of the teams have given up on, on passive sensing and vision and are, are using LIDAR and radar. Is there any hope for vision? Is that a reasonable... Uh, um, so. I, I have a big hope for vision. I mean, that's a piece of why I'm, I'm interested in some of the research following on from this. But maybe not quite in the way that the computer vision community has tended to look at vision in that um, I think that there's a real opportunity here for using active and passive sensing together. And I'm much more interested in that step than trying to solve this level of complexity problem with purely passive sensors. Um, I think that the degree of complexity of these environments, even in the urban challenge, which is a lot simpler than, you know, even just trying to drive out of the parking lot here, much less say on 101 at rush hour, um, that, 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 that the complexity there is high enough that we've got to use all the sensors we have available to us rather than just restricting ourselves to vision. Um, but, you know, one of the bad things about LIDAR is with just a point cloud, it's very hard to do any sort of identification. So several times we thought K-rails were cars. Um, and with vision, you would never make that mistake. A K-rail, the point cluster may be car-sized, but there's nothing else about it that looks car-like. Um, and so I think integrating these different sensing modalities is really, really important. Um, so I guess one last, one last question, is that? Are any of the competitors taking their uh, expertise to important commercial markets like toys? Yeah, so the question is, uh, is any of this expertise being taken to important commercial markets like toys? I think right now, 
the main commercial markets that I know of that are aware of this are the auto companies who've really changed their view of the role of automation in cars in the last few years. Um, I would hope, I, so I'm not aware, for example, of toy, toy companies doing this, which doesn't mean they're not, it's just I'm, I'm not aware of any. Um, you know, I know one thing DARPA was trying to do with the very wide scale publicity and running this largely as a media event was to look for a broad range of, of, of possible spin outs of the technology. Um, but I think, you know, Autonomous toys is a great uh, is, is, is a great possible environment uh, for looking at these. I mean, some of the techniques that we developed and others are going to have a hard time there because we all depended on good inertial navigation, um, and you know it's it's pretty important to be able to project your representation of the environment forward over time in an accurate way. And if you don't know how you, if you don't know what your ego motion was, um, that's hard. On the other hand, that's a place where computer vision might actually save us. Um, Bob Bowles and colleagues at SRI just down the road here have done some very nice work on, on visually based, uh, uh, visually based um, uh, IMUs. So basically visually based uh, inertial motion, not, inert not inertial, but non-inertial motion, visually based motion estimation over time. Um, and that you could put in a, in a toy. All right, well, thanks, and I'm happy to answer other questions afterwards.